morning. Another day, another trip to the John Deere dealership. Okay, I'm not trying to pick on this semi driver or his equipment. Would you just look at how this trailer is tracking? It's almost like a dog. It's hanging to the right. Something must need realigned. I'm not a trailer expert, so I couldn't tell you what. Definitely a little off in one area or another. Somewhere in this mess of tractors is our 9460R. And I'd venture to say that the key is not with it, so I'm going to run inside and get that. I ran inside, got us a key. Not exactly sure if it's our key. They're all the same though, so it doesn't really matter. And I got some really good news. No, it's not that they've set up our brand new 12 rail folding corn head. They don't exactly seem to be in a hurry to do that, and we're not really in a hurry to get it. No, no, no. The really good news is that the brand new Hagee that belongs to the individual who's used Hagee I am buying has been built. And I believe it's around here somewhere. This is not a brand new Hagee we're looking at, but I thought it was a fitting background for that commentary. They're getting a brand new STS 16, 1600 gallon high clearance sprayer, and we are getting their used STS 12, 1200 gallon high clearance sprayer. Unlike a lot of our run-ins with brand new equipment over the last couple of years with manufacturing delays, supply shortages, this sprayer is actually gonna be in on time, meaning that we will get our used sprayer in time to have everything ready to roll for this spring because it's not really that far away before we'll be thinking about spraying and ultimately planning. That's not the sprayer either. That is what a brand new one looks like, styled a little bit differently than the 2020 that we're getting. This one here is an STS-12, so same size, just brand new model. It'd be cool if you could just click the key fob and set off the alarm on your tractor like a car in a big parking lot to know where it's at. But John Deere doesn't really invest too much money in key technology. On most of the newer tractors, this one key will get you into everything. I'd say this one belongs to us. It's dirty, like most of our tractors, and it's got a PTO, which is more uncommon than you'd think. Although the one parked next to it literally also has a PTO, so take that back, I guess. Oh yes, this is definitely our tractor. I can tell just by the way it is. Looks like something we'd have. Dirty windows, dirty floors, small fingerprints from children. Looks like our work. We'll use our skeleton key to get this thing fired up and let it get warm before we roll. <laughs> it's almost comical how simple it really is. A couple hundred thousand dollar tractor. You can use a key that's about a dime a dozen to get into it, start it, and drive away with it. But to download a free app on your iPhone, you about have to draw blood to get logged in. There's definitely a little bit of contrast and logic there, though it would be rather hard to steal one of these tractors and keep it hidden, so maybe they're not concerned about that. Now that right there is a pretty nice tractor. I'd love to have a 4850. We had some years ago that they're long since removed from our operation. You really gotta appreciate those tractors though. Good machines. This 9460R was not at the dealership for any particular reason. We've certainly found it advantageous financially and operationally to have these 9460Rs and all of our equipment in general that's very important taken into our local dealership every two, three, maybe four years to be looking over by a qualified and experienced service technician. That little bit of extra legwork and a little bit more of a monetary investment does help increase our uptime. Of course, we could take this to the field on the first day and it could break down, but that's just the nature of the beast. I couldn't name off the list of what they've done, but there was some preventative maintenance done to it. They changed a few things out. And this is the tractor that had the inconveniently placed blown hydraulic line on the back. We figured what a better person to change it than a John Deere technician. They are much more qualified and quicker at their job than we would be. A lot of these things we probably could do, though it does pay to have someone who's looked at hundreds of them to analyze your tractor. What we see is a small scope. These guys are pumping tractors, combines, everything under the sun in and out of these doors every day. So they know what to look for. 9460 is nice and warm. Let's get this thing home. How funny would it be to get home and get a phone call like, yeah, uh, you took the wrong tractor. That one wasn't yours. Don't think that'll happen, but it would be funny. Oh, a little bit of a lump in the tire. I can't decide if it's raining or if I went through a big puddle. Either way, there's water on the windshield. There's still a little bit of water hanging around in the waterways. We had about three inches, maybe a little less than that, at the tail end of last week. And then yesterday, we got another half inch or so. There's no doubt that there's plenty of moisture in the ground right now for this time of year. Nice and saturated to start the growing season. 
Okay, we're nearly at the home farm where we store our tractors, obviously, and that puts us to our next issue. I know at this point I'm gonna sound like I'm beating a dead horse, but we are very quickly running out of storage space for all of our equipment. We've got the newer planter, both planters being hooked up in the barn alone consumes a lot of space, especially because we don't have our tillage implements outside. I know without a shadow of a doubt that this tractor would not fit in the big shed without doing some serious rearranging, and even then it may not go in. So we are gonna call an audible and temporarily store this year at the red barn. Typically we don't put our bigger equipment there just because we keep small things that we can move in and out quickly at this shed. We are gonna try it though. The problem with the really big tractors and the combines is that a lot of times we're concerned about them clearing this standard height door. When this barn was built, farm equipment was not this tall. The new shed was designed with new equipment in mind, obviously. This one though, not at all. I know for a fact the 9620 will not fit in here because it sits so high. For those of you who are concerned about that corn head, it's the one that will be traded off on the 12 row folder. So that's why it's parked outside. They just haven't gotten us the 12 row, so we haven't gotten them the eight row. Chris should be on the other side of this double door getting it slid open pretty soon. Although he's very reliable, he's not always the fastest. There he is. Looks like this will fit under the roof. Or at least I think so. How's it look up there? I think we'll clear. I don't know why I'm so concerned. I believe that we've had this tractor in here before, back when it was hooked into the grain cart. This ought to be out of the way for now, until we go to get the seed tenders out. We've still got plenty of space in this shed to work with. Enough to fit an extra tractor or two, and most likely this is where we'll park the Hagee at when we get it. Because this is a convenient spot for it. It'd be nice to have it at the overhead for quick access, but we typically keep the semis there. Maybe if we could get rid of the old high boy, that extra tin wheeler we don't use we'd have quite a bit more space. The 4520 though, it's not for sale. The weather outside right now is far from ideal, so I wanted to take a moment to answer the million dollar question that you've all been continuously asking me in the comments. And no, it's not why does my dad always wear red t-shirts? That's something you have to take up with him. The real million dollar question that I'm often asked is why do we have so much John Deere equipment are we John Deere fanboys? Do we hate other colors of equipment? Please tell us why you have so much green and yellow. To be honest, that is a perfectly fair question and I can see why a lot of people would be asking that, seeing as we have so much John Deere equipment. There is no John Deere fanboy club. That's not how this works. You don't get any special discounts by having a large amount of John Deere equipment unless you make some huge order all at once and get a multi-unit discount. We're not gonna dive into those weeds today. I know at times it may seem like I dislike other brands of equipment because we have all this John Deere, or maybe I take an innocent jab at another brand. Although it may not seem like it, those jokes and low blows and jabs really are just honest fun. I have no problems with any other brand of equipment. Really, I think that Pretty much any equipment that's still in the market today is high quality, should be reliable, and something that you should be proud to own. We have John Deere for a variety of reasons. None of them is because the opposition or the other brands are so inferior to John Deere. I do think John Deere as a whole has some strengths in their lineup, as well as some weaknesses. For instance, one of John Deere's strengths is how darn good looking this equipment is. One of its weaknesses is how expensive this equipment is. Let's play that same thought experiment with Kloss Lexion Combines. Powerful and innovative are definitely their strengths. Their weakness is that they break down a lot. See, there I go again with those innocent jokes. No, but in all reality, I think that every major brand out there today really makes phenomenal equipment. There are some outliers in terms of negative experiences that one individual may have with a certain machine or brand or operation in general. We've had that instance with one of our John Deere combines. The last one was a complete lemon. That experience alone was not enough to send us away from John Deere. Since I'm not really gonna be doing a whole lot of work outside today and I've got some time to kill, let's run over to the other shed. I'll draw up my thoughts on the whiteboard about why we run John Deere. Explaining why or why not farmers do certain things can be as simple or as complex as you want it to be. For the sake of not making this last forever, I boiled my opinions down to four main points as to why one operation runs a certain color or brand of equipment, assuming that the brands all offer the specific equipment they need. 
If you're a cotton farmer, obviously you need a brand that supports cotton equipment. If you're a corn farmer, well, most farmers offer some kind of product for corn farmers, but you get what I'm saying. Here it is, ladies and gentlemen, the four reasons why I think a farmer runs the equipment they run. Number one, service, two parts, three resale, and last but not least, technology. Let's start at the top, service. Service and parts could almost be bundled together, though I do think they are slightly separate. Service is most important because like I mentioned, every single piece of equipment, regardless of color, breaks down. Our John Deere equipment breaks down, Bill and Stan Uphoff's case equipment breaks down, maybe more than ours. Okay, I said I'd stop doing that. You get the point I'm making. Everything breaks down, nothing's perfect, things fail, equipment falls apart, you are going to need to have an active and healthy service department. This point actually becomes very regional. In our area, in a 20 to 25 mile radius, I could probably hit five John Deere dealerships. I don't know, that's just spitballing, there's a lot. In terms of case dealerships, there may be one or two. Cost dealerships, there's not one within 40 or 45 miles. Fint, there's one 20 miles away, just one. And when something breaks down, having dealerships with qualified mechanics in close proximity to your main operation is a very big positive. For us, it is a no-brainer in that regards to run John Deere because we have all these dealerships, especially because we know how qualified some of the mechanics at these dealerships are. These guys are experts at diagnosing and repairing problems faster than we ever could, and they're just a stone's throw down the road. That is a huge deal. Parts are along the same lines with multiple dealerships in the area. Nearby parts availability should be robust. There's no guarantees on that because some parts are a little bit more niche, not as common, so people don't supply them. I will speculate that one major advantage John Deere has in the parts department is that because they have such a large market share of equipment business in the United States, subsequently, there is a large amount of parts warehoused around the area that are quickly accessible. If not within a couple of hours, definitely within a day. That's huge. If something breaks on your tractor, you know that a brand like John Deere has so many units out there that they also have the parts supply to back it up. Of course, there was some exceptions over the last couple years with some individual parts that were hard to come by, but that happened to other brands and some of the smaller brands especially because they just did not have the manufacturing to keep up with the breakdowns and unfortunate incidents that happened to equipment. Again, when I talk about the regionality of this, if you go to a different pocket of a state, you may find areas where most of the people run red equipment. There's not a lot of John Deere. I'm in a heavy John Deere equipment area. If you were to venture up to Ron from Hartung Family Farms operation, they're all running red and they have the exact opposite experiences as we do. There is a ton of red dealerships around. Subsequently, the support is phenomenal for that equipment. In my humble opinion, service and parts, which are the top two on our list, is really what is holding back some of these European brands from gaining more market share in the United States. Don't get me wrong, I think Fint makes one of the nicest tractors in the market right now, and I'd love to run one. I think the Kloss Lexion is probably one of the top combines, although the X9 sure is chasing after it closely, but service and parts are a huge issue for those. Regardless of how often they break down, when they do break down, there's just not as many dealerships or parts warehouses around our area. I don't care how efficient, productive, or luxurious the equipment you're running is. If that thing is broken down for a long time, I can guarantee you that you will be extremely upset. We had a similar experience with our brand new John Deere S780 combine two harvests ago, where it broke down and it was out of commission for five or six days. Typically, our local John Deere dealership would have loaner combines on hand to supply someone who bought a brand new one and it completely went out while they got the parts in and got it serviced, but it wasn't the case. It was a unique circumstance and overall unfortunate. However, that is something that leaves a very sour taste in your mouth and we were not happy about that. It wasn't enough to convert us away from Deere, it was enough though to get us to complain, not that that takes too much. Along these same lines, the Gold Star service from Fint, where they'll service everything under the sun on your tractor for two or 3,000 hours, up to three or four or five years, don't know the specifics. I do think that is a huge selling point. I do commend them for offering that. It's like a full warranty. If anything breaks on it in that period, they fix it, and they will immediately supply you a loaner to run, which 
is promising a lot, in my opinion. If they actually hold true to all that, anyone who runs them, I think that that is a huge selling point. The third point on our list, resale value. Resale value has a lot to do with why you do not see farmers continuously switch back and forth from different brands of equipment. As farmers with a large amount of John Deere equipment, our equipment is most valuable to John Deere dealerships. If we take it to a case or a fit or some other brand, unless they're trying to give out sweetheart deals to buy business, they're not gonna offer you as much for your tractor or combine or anything as a John Deere dealership would. And I think the same holds true on the opposite side of the coin. If you're a case farmer, you'd see the same thing. In my opinion, that is why farmers do stick with the same brand for a long time. Once you've kind of got that ball rolling, it's hard to financially pull it away. I'm not saying in particular that any brand has better resale value. I've heard rumors and chatter here and there that X or Y brand has terrible resale value, but it's really hard to say that it's going to hold its value if you take a Kloss Combine to a John Deere dealership to trade off on an X9. They're just not gonna give you as much for it. It's common sense. It's the same thing with cars and trucks. A GM is not worth as much to a Ford dealership as a Ford is. So that is why resale value kind of continues the lineage of the same brand of equipment being on one farm. My last point, number four, technology. Technology is a much more complicated topic than it appears at face value. I know many of you are already starting to type your comments. How can John Deere have better technology? Everything they have, they've stolen from Kinsey or Kloss or other brands. Nothing they have is original. Okay, well, let's just take that idea, throw it out the window, I'm tired of seeing it. Regardless as to whether or not there's truth to that, there are some things where John Deere dominates, in my opinion, and part of the reason why we stay with John Deere. First and foremost, I do think John Deere's steering systems, their technology, their guidance displays are the best in the industry. They're the most straightforward, the easiest to learn, and really the simplest to operate. I spent a very minimal amount of time in that Case AFS Connect quad track last fall doing dirt work, and I still don't know if I could get you through that monitor in a timely fashion. It seemed very confusing to me. Maybe that's just because I'm a John Deere guy. I don't know. From what I've gathered around, John Deere does have the advantage when it comes to auto steer. That's not to say that other brands do not provide value with their systems. I just personally think that John Deere probably still has an edge. They can certainly catch up if they make the right moves. When it comes to equipment production, one could certainly argue that because John Deere is so dominant that they probably have a much bigger research and development budget. As we move forward into the future, it will be interesting to see if John Deere continues to run strong innovate and do things that put them above their competition. I don't know, I guess we'll see how the cards fall on that one. The last tidbit of information I wanna offer you for technology has nothing to do with who innovates the most, who has the best technology. It comes down to the technology suite and how hard it is to convert to a different one. Like I said, we run all John Deere. We have an extensive amount of financial investment in John Deere steering systems, displays, and guidance receivers. I mean, it's a tremendous amount of money we've had to invest to make sure that all of our equipment has what we need for those systems to function properly. Much like you wouldn't be able to use an Apple Watch very well on an Android phone, it's complicated to start intermixing those systems between brands. Now, I have noticed that a lot of the third-party brands have made it factory options or a very simple aftermarket to hook up John Deere systems into their brands because they realize that John Deere is just so popular in the industry when it comes to guidance. But the fact that changing equipment may require you to run different computer systems, guidance systems, that is a big holding point for farmers thinking about stepping away from a brand like John Deere. This point also applies to farmers using John Deere's operation system cloud online that is capturing and storing all of their planting and harvest data. Every pass they made, they're able to analyze with that system which is a hard thing to go away from if you switch to another brand that has inferior products in that department. And lastly, let's talk about the most complicated thing to do, putting green equipment with red equipment. Let's say you wanna run our John Deere planters on a red tractor. Well, that can get a little messy. It's certainly possible, but there are some hoops you have to jump through. The complexity of trying to cross over brands like that often stops farmers from venturing out and trying new things. If there's anything on your farm where it's really simple to take a step towards a different brand, it's on simple tractors. Your front wheel assists and your four wheel drives don't really do anything complicated. 
As technology continues to advance and spread its way onto tillage implements, more on planters, you'll see how much harder it is to intermix those planters between brands. Again, it's just another way that brands can keep you loyal by making it a very hard transition to use other color equipment. That being said, it could be as complicated as all those points I just made, or maybe once upon a time, your grandpappy bought a John Deere 4020, thought it was the bee's knees, and ever since then, everything you own was John Deere, or Case, or whatever. You get the point. To be completely fair with you all, I am not an expert. I am just a very opinionated farmer. I love to hear what you all have to say, so drop me a comment, give me your feedback, give me your opinion. I'll get back to you when I can. I appreciate it. This, ladies and gentlemen, is exactly what March is like on the farm. One moment it's sunny and 75 and you're daydreaming about planting. The next minute it's below freezing again and snowing and you're just wishing it'll warm back up. Today is the 13th of March, which means we're probably three weeks away from the earliest possible plant date that I could foresee based on the forecast. In the spirit of getting something productive done, we are gonna go ahead and haul some corn today. Gotta keep that train moving if you wanna have them empty by fall. Obviously the weather isn't very enticing for working outside. The grain markets right now are even less attractive if you're trying to haul old crop corn in. Seems to be very weak. We're seeing prices fall way off. Corn's gonna be flirting with $6 cash pretty shortly. Like I said a few videos ago, we were able to sell some corn over the scales last fall for $6.50, $6.60, maybe even $6.70 depending on the time. So we're already 60 to 70 cents in the hole currently if we were to sell today. We are gonna speculate on the market like we normally do, see if we get some excitement in the markets going into spring and summer, which is typically a volatile time, though the US farmers are probably gonna plant a lot of acres of corn and soybeans because they are on paper still pretty profitable. <laughs> before this fall. Getting pretty worn out compared to the neighbor on the front. The only positive aspect of grain prices starting to creep back downward is that fertilizer and other chemical inputs are kind of following suit. We paid sky high inputs over the last couple seasons compared to the long-term average, though we did receive much more on average for our crop. So there's a give and a take there. It is kind of interesting, maybe even a conspiracy, how closely fertilizer and inputs follow grain prices. And they'll try and tell you they're not related, doesn't seem that way. With prices of both grains and inputs in mind over the last year, let's say, there is one predicament that farmers can definitely find themselves in, and that is having high dollar fall prepay inputs locked in and applied to their farms without hedged grain or price grain for the next growing season to follow suit. To try to explain this in as simple of terms as possible, some people lock everything in, in the fall on the fertilizer side and maybe finalize chemical in the off season or the winter. Other people play it more by ear and just pay cash whenever they need it. Some people just pay for things in the spring for that crop. In my opinion, most of the time it's better to pay for things in the fall. However, we are in a unique circumstance where prices have dropped enough on both grains and inputs that you are significantly better off not having paid for anything. This price inversion, as I'd like to say, is something that can happen to farmers on a rare occasion after a very high run up in both grain and input prices. Everyone out of fear of paying huge dollar amounts like they did last spring to grow their crops if they were on the cash price, they ended up locking in fall prepays. Lo and behold, did not hedge any grain or make any forward sales for the upcoming growing season. And they could find themselves in a unfortunate scenario where their cost is much higher than the amount of gross dollar value they're gonna bring in off their crop, assuming they have average yields and take cash prices. I apologize, that may have been a lot of words that might not have made sense to a lot of you. Basically, people paid for things without guaranteeing a certain premium for their crops. That premium kind of has withered away over the winter, and now they're looking at less profitable margins. I'm not saying there isn't money to be made. That's not what I'm saying at all. Farmers can still make money. However, it is going to be a little tighter if they end up in that situation. Myself personally, I don't quite have that appetite for risk. I ended up hedging any grain possible, not that I have a substantial amount of ground or anything of the sort, 
but I made a considerable amount of sales on new crop corn December 2023 contract for 615 to 620 a bushel. So that locks me in on fall delivery at probably 580 to 590. They are HDA contracts or hedge to arrive, meaning that I've locked in the futures market price, but I am still at risk of basis, which is something I'm willing to take on. I mean, that's just the nature of the beast. I think right now I'm in a pretty good spot because I am almost 60 cents per bushel in the money on those contracts, which is better than being 60 cents out of the money. That has nothing to do with me being a marketing genius. I just saw what it was going to cost us to grow corn and how much I was gonna be paying to rent a farm to do all these things and thought, you know, maybe I should lock in a little bit of a profit assuming we have a decent crop. And that's what I did. Right now it looks good, who knows, by this summer, if we burn up and don't have a crop and are looking at eight to $9 corn, may not be as advantageous. I'll probably repeat this a million times over the lifetime of my channel. I personally believe that grain marketing is bar none the most complicated part of farming. It's the hardest thing to predict and oftentimes you don't make the right decision and it can have major implications on the profitability of your farm. I feel like this barn gets tighter and tighter every day. I called Chris this morning and told him to get everything ready to load, so there should be turnkey, hopefully. You never know with Chris. Oh yes, I definitely miss the sunny and 70 degree weather. Could be worse though, like those farmers in Minnesota that got three foot of snow on the ground. some nice train artwork. There's always some neat graffiti on these things. Even though that was definitely a crime to be put on there. It does look kind of cool. Drum roll please. Ba -ba 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 -bum. The results are in and the test weight is exactly the same as everything else we bought. 59 and a half pounds per bushel at 15.7% moisture. Although I feel like something's not adding up on this because I had almost 80,000 pounds gross on that truck. Normally, I can't do that at anything over 15% moisture. So maybe we'll see where the next load comes in at. This could have just been first load through the probe this morning at the elevator, had a weird test sample, or it could be the way the corn is in this bin. Either way, it's hard to be disappointing. Not exactly a spectacular test weight, it's kind of what we've come to expect, but it's far from disappointing. There's another load to the elevator, a tad bit drier and a little bit heavier, but not really that much different than the first load. So I guess I was just full of it about this corn being heavier than normal. It seems to be about the same as everything else. Oh, what more could you ask for? A man, his truck, and the open road. Actually, don't answer that. I can think of a lot of things I'd rather be doing than trucking. Not that it's not very important, it's just not the most exciting thing. I've been hauling corn for a couple of days off camera. I didn't exactly want to bore you all with that action. Today, because it is going to be a little bit warmer and the ground is firmed up, I'm gonna try and hop in the gator once I get the truck home and do some more mapping and setting guidance line for the spring. One thing that I've definitely noticed in my travels through the countryside is that more and more farmers are starting to drag their planters out of the shed. You can tell that although the weather is not ideal, planting season is getting very close because when some of these people decide to drag their planter out, you're only a couple weeks away. Every farm is completely different. Some have their stuff ready to go in January. There's also a select few that wait until late March or early April, hook it up last minute, and then realize that they probably should have done it a month earlier because there's all sorts of things that need replaced. 
To each your own, though. Can't really judge. You do what you want with your farm. You've got the keys to your own kingdom. I most certainly could keep hauling out of this bin. I think within a day of solid hauling out of it, we'd probably hit the area where we need to turn on the sweep auger. As opposed to Chris and I doing all the work in there, I figured what a better way to welcome back my Uncle Jeff from his winter vacation than, hey, grab a shovel, we're sweeping out a grain bin. Just what you wanna hear when you roll up, it's 30 degrees compared to the 80 to 90 that Florida's been for the last week. I also just need to get all of this mapping done. I've done a lot of this ground around home. I still have a few fields that are in close proximity. My only concern is that we had a little bit of a frost this morning. Even if it was dry on top last night, the frost always brings extra moisture up. The last time I came out here and knocked a bunch of this out, the same thing happened. It was dry, the frost came in, it melted that morning when the sun came out like it is right now, and the ground was just a complete soup until the afternoon. So I'm gonna walk out here and verify that I'm not gonna make a mess because the gator is already filthy. Almost looks like the frost hasn't found its way out of the ground all the way yet. And it does appear that it may be a little bit soft in spots. Actually, I don't know. I may have to wait till this afternoon to do that. When you spend enough time working on a farm, you come to the realization that it seems like Mother Nature is always trying to work against you. One moment the ground's ready to go, the next it's not quite as ideal. Dad's doing a head count on the closing wheels on the planter. He's decided to get enough of the spiked wheels to finish off the 12 or so rows that only have one spiked wheel. That way the entire planter will have two on each one. You might as well square everything off. They seem to do well last year, so not really that big of a price to pay. Dad also thinks that on the 8R370 and the DB60 combo, we should take this three point quick hitch off. That way we don't have any potential collisions between it and the cylinder area on the DB60. It looked like it was out of the way to me, but he thought that that would help him sleep a little bit better at night. Makes sense when you consider the value of replacing some of this stuff. Before we get too far ahead of ourselves on that project, I may text a few of the farmers in the area I know that are running these DB60 planters on a front wheel assist and see what they're doing. Because that is a little bit heavier than the quick hitches we take off of our smaller, more utility-like tractors. It'd be much easier with a loader and a chain because it is in an awkward position. We've got a lot of compromised hoses. We don't exactly want to drop that on all that beautiful hydraulic lines and electrical lines. It's just a mess waiting to happen. So we'll verify that we even need to do that. I can't say that I blame any of the farmers who have not done any of their spring prep work yet. When it's 30 degrees outside, I'll do it tomorrow feels like the right response to looking at these projects. Now when it's 70 degrees, it's a lot more enjoyable to do this kind of work. Eventually though, you just gotta start getting things done, which is kind of what we're working on. Some of you may recall a few videos ago, I mentioned that that DB60 is a little bit different to unfold than my dad's exact Emerge planner or the 1790 we had before that. So when I had some free time over the last couple days at home, I put together kind of a cheat sheet to help anyone, AKA my dad, unfold that planner if they get in there and they find themselves a little bit confused. So I'm gonna go ahead and print this out and see if it turns out how good I think it will. I guess I should clarify, it's not exactly gospel by any means, but it should be better though than trying to talk them through it on the phone. Either the printer's cold or I'm asking a lot out of it because it's not moving very quickly right now. Fingers crossed that this turns out all right. Normally when I do a project like this, it takes about 10 reprints and a bunch of shifting of information to make it look nice. Oh, it's coming. There it is. That actually turned out better than I expected it to. Like I said, just a cheat sheet. Hopefully it'll help my dad or anyone else that hops in that planner crawl through the unfolding process. I only gave the unfolding instructions because one, I didn't want to waste a lot of ink and paper, but more specifically, folding it is literally just the opposite. So I say somewhere on here, if you want to fold it, just repeat this in opposite order. I printed out my second copy. I was almost beating my chest with how proud it turned out. I was reading through it and then I realized on the back page, I repeated step five twice. Step five, turn on the switch. Also step five, use SCV1 to complete translift sequence. Six and seven. So this should be six, seven, eight. And I messed it up and I'm a perfectionist, so I'm gonna toss these and waste a little bit more ink to reprint all of it. Of course, in typical Andy-led project fashion, it's not letting me edit this correctly from my phone, so I gotta go home to my desktop to do it, which means that 
it's not going to get done right now. But you guys get the idea. Let's just say I was like 90% effective. Just need to reprint it. One really nice thing about this planner is it's got the color coordinated and labeled hydraulic fittings on the end. So each one has a color that coordinates with which SCV it's on. And it's also labeled whether it's a pressure or a return. Meaning that our lives next spring when we have to hook this up, it's going to be much easier because we don't have to resort to a picture or some kind of scribbly drawing to see what goes where. Other than that neat little upgrade, if you remember hooking up the Xactimerge planner, these two really aren't that much different. Our vacuum return line has three lines plumbed into one because it has three vacuum returns and not two like the other planner. Got our main returns, all that stuff. Pretty much the same setup, even down to the generator. I wouldn't be surprised if you couldn't take this generator off and put it on the other planner and it still worked perfectly fine because it's probably the same thing. See, ladies and gentlemen, this is a prime example of deer doing things to help take care of their customers. It only took a 400 plus thousand dollar planner to have the cool labeled hydraulic ends, but they've got them, so it's worth something. Let's just hope and possibly pray that this planner isn't a lemon because these things do have a tendency to come from the factory with a few gremlins. Pinched hydraulic lines, electrical issues. As long as we can avoid that, I think we'll be pretty happy with this new machine. The sun's been out and the wind has been blowing for a little while, so let's walk out in the field, see if it's firmed up at all. It's starting to slightly, may need another couple hours, so this quite possibly could be an after lunch project with the gator. I've given the ground a few hours to dry. I ran home, edited my planner unfold cheat sheet, printed those off, and of course ate lunch. Now I'm back out here at the farm, hoping to do some mapping. This isn't exactly a fair comparison because this is soybean stubble, a little bit lighter ground. You can see though, just a little bit of time is all it needed, a lot firmer. I'm willing to bet a large sum of money that the Gator has a flat tire because that's just tradition at this point. Probably ought to pop that thing off, take it to the tire shop soon. Yep, I told you guys, should have trusted me. And for the millionth time this year, we're gonna be using the good old Milwaukee tire inflator. Screw it on. Oh, a whopping three and a half PSI in this thing. We'll do 30. As you can see, the Gator is a little bit on the dirty side. Actually, more on the extremely dirty side from last time I went mapping. Got a little bit softer than I was expecting, which I'm hoping to avoid. Let's also just pray that the Gator starts, which is not necessarily likely. Oh, barely had enough. This wash through the field's gotten a little more severe since that last rain we got a week ago. I'm really pushing drainage as a higher priority on our farm to stop this erosion. May have to cut some terraces in certain places. Really, the last ditch effort is to put in a waterway. Typically, a central Illinois farmer is probably not going to choose a waterway over being able to farm that. The alternative is either bigger berms in the ditch, maybe some terraces, or something to slow the water down. I've already mapped all of these fields. The reason I'm out here is to pick up these markers I left because we had some tile holes professionally repaired. There was more than just two, but here's one and there's a second one over there. The reason they were professionally done, other than us not having time to get to it, is because there's the tile hole right there and these yellow flags are the natural gas pipeline. One of three that runs across here that we didn't really want to screw with. I think another one's 20 foot over or so. so those are all fixed up. I'm getting our markers just because they're too nice to run over with a field cultivator. This is here in the southwest corner of that main farm. You can see we've got a lot of drainage issues here that need addressed. There's a decent amount of grade from our farm down to the south end where the water's headed. Typically with grade, if you get a large enough rain, you start to get washes cut throughout. I have high hopes to get all these fixed in the next couple of years, but time may be of the essence. Probably get done a little quicker if we had our own excavating equipment. You really can't fix this with a backhoe. You need either a dozer or a turn pole, maybe a grader, possibly even a tile plow. It'd be nice to add a few of those things to our farm. However, it's not necessarily justifiable based off these few problems alone. A lot of times, even with our acreage, it pencils a lot better to hire a contractor to come out and fix these as opposed to doing it yourself. Either way, I'd like to get it fixed. At the bare minimum, it's not fun to farm around, and at the worst, it's 
really not that good for your soil to have it all wash away. Okay, well, scratch that idea. That's way too wet. I don't know how this field that's a half mile away from home can be so wet, yet I've got dust rolling off up there. You see, this is why it's so darned hard to get anything done in the early spring or late winter. Really, the best time to do all this would be during a solid deep frost inside of an enclosed and heated gator cap. Unfortunately, I don't have all those amenities. I've got the nice steering systems, but no heat. And I'm not gonna come out here when it's zero degrees and do the mapping. It's just not reasonable, nor would it be that enjoyable. That being said, those of you who are interested in something like that, John Deere does now offer a brand new gator fully enclosed heated air conditioning, which they've had that for a while. What it has that other gators do not have though is steering valves, meaning that you can actually hook up a steering system, a receiver and a display with the proper activations and your gator would steer itself. Really genius, other than the fact that it's extremely expensive. I'm sure there's a niche market there for people who'd use that. For mapping, it's not gonna do you any good because you need to have the field map to use the auto steer stuff. So I don't know, maybe there's a market, maybe there's not. For me though, I may be done with this project already today. Not that I've worked a whole lot on it. Back to the shed. Yeah, I probably should have just hauled corn today. It wasn't the most productive or eventful day for me by any means. Today, in the spirit of making more space in the seed shed, I'm gonna check one of our other barns to see if there's a spot where I can move my mom's boat so that it's not blocking up some valuable floor space where our seed is stored because once we get the rest of our corn in not going to be much room left in there. Thankfully we have this small shed in the tiny village of Etna that we store a lot of miscellaneous equipment, old trucks, some small tractors, our drapers, and a few boats in. So we'll see if there's somewhere in here I can back this boat so it's out of the way. Would you look at that? There's a spot for the boat right next to another boat. And no, these other boats are not our boats. We we're just generous with our storage space. I would also argue slightly wasteful with our space as well because these old wagons are pretty much worthless, but my dad thinks they need to be stored inside, so that's where they are. I doubt we're gonna be putting up a new shed anytime in the short term, so we are gonna have to get creative here moving forward with the Hagee, the tanker trailer, the bigger corn head, the bigger planter. They're all gonna consume a lot of space. I've developed a game plan to shuffle some stuff around. I want to move the small lawnmower trailer out of that barn back home somewhere. We'll just park it on the lot at the main farm because we will be using it pretty soon. Spring definitely means that we'll be planting. It also means that we'll have to start mowing again, so we will need that. And it will free up a little bit of space once I get that moved back after I go get a hitch for it we should be able to move the boat down in its spot. Easy peasy. All right, just got the hitch I needed for my parents' house. It's my hitch, I don't know why they even had it. Now we're headed back to the barn to get the small trailer. Headed back to our she shed. I think that's the trendy thing to call these things nowadays. Especially because my mom's boat is what's gonna be going in it, so it is a she shed. Beep, 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 beep. Yeah, my. There's always got to be something in the way. By the way, if any of you are interested in purchasing one of these fine tin wheelers with aluminum beds, please get a hold of me. We would love to get these out of this shed, and we do not plan on using them anytime soon. They're nice trailers. The powertrain probably has room for improvement. The beds, though, are phenomenal. That kind of paints our predicament with trying to sell these. They've literally been parked here for five to 10 years now. The truck itself isn't really worth that much. That's probably a dime a dozen to get that powertrain. The aluminum beds though, brand new, are pretty expensive. And I doubt they've really lost much value because they're quite literally aluminum. They haven't really degraded at all. Dad's not willing to sell the combination at a discount. If we really wanted to get our monies out of them, we'd be better off taking the bed and the hoist off, selling it separate from the actual truck. But that's a lot of work and we haven't exactly got there. I like to get rid of these two and the one back at the main red shed just because we don't use them. All they're doing is acquiring dust and taking up space. Do a little extra leg work to make this simpler when I pull it out. Do 
mal. Äh. A lot of play in that. For as long as I can recall, we've always kept a hitch of the correct size with a trailer. So that way it's not on the truck driver to have the hitch. We've got an extra hitch with the trailer. They're not really that expensive, so it's not a big deal in that regard. The issue though, is that this one and seven eighths inch ball hitch is too small to fit far enough into my truck hitch receiver to actually pin through. And I didn't have my fancy drop down aluminum two stage hitch. So I had to make an extra trip for that. We're gonna take this trailer back home somewhere. Then we're gonna grab mom's boat, bring it here, free up all sorts of space. I'm not even sure if this trailer has a license plate on it right now, so I'm coming up the back way to the farm to avoid the highways. Hey, don't judge me. We've all been there before, it happens. I'm not intentionally doing anything against the law. However, there is a slight possibility that this does not have a license on it. So I should have checked, but for now, we're just going another half mile and we'll be off the road again, so not a big deal. I know you were all worried about me and that little trek, but we made it to the farm without the feds catching us. These short little trailers are the squirreliest things on this planet. You blink your eye once and it's jackknifed the other direction. All right, let's go boating. I just know that something's gonna be in the way. And there's something right there. The old blade tractor. I'm gonna just move it over here to the south a little bit. I went to move it over thinking it was gonna be out of the way. Turns out it was still in the way. So I just pulled it outside and leave it right in real quick while I drag out the boat. Of course, before we do that, we gotta put our hitch on. That's a heavy duty hitch. That tells you who used the boat last. It was either me or my brother-in-law. The boat's out and ready for shipment. Now I just gotta put the tractor back in. This tractor can be moved around at really any moment, so it doesn't matter where I park it. Maybe a little early, possibly a little too cold, but we're going boating today. <laughs> this is a strange looking spot for a boat ramp. The one nice thing we'll be able to do here is, as opposed to backing it in and pulling my hair out in the process, because it's kind of tight here to wind around, we can open the south door, then just pull it through and maneuver how we want. So we're gonna pop this open. I'm gonna get in my truck, just come around from the south, head north, pull right in, easy peasy. shed was actually a pretty good acquisition for us about 10 or 15 years ago. It was full of junk when my dad bought it. Prior to that, there used to be an old grain elevator here along the railroad tracks in Etna, and this was open storage. So there was augers ran through the top. They would fill this with corn. Then it was full of pallets for whatever reason, I don't know. And now we have it. This stuff, all sorts of valuable and not so valuable equipment in. I'd say we got some rain moving in, Chris. Yeah. What are they calling for? Uh, half inch, maybe 
between a quarter and a half. They didn't really, they really don't know. Just got a notification on my phone that it's going to be raining here within the next 20 to 30 minutes. Before the downpour occurs, I'm gonna hop in the gator, run over to a few more fields. I'm not gonna try and do any mapping. I've pretty much given up on that for this point in the week. But I'm gonna take the gator out, grab a few more markers I left out for fixing tile holes. I'm gonna mark a few other tile holes, then zip back because I wanna do something before the rain comes. dropped the combine off into when I was running it, opening up this field south of Lakeland. Definitely gonna flag that one. If I recall correctly, there's three or four in a row here on this farm. And there's the remnants down there of a flag that once existed till probably the vertical till came flying through here. Okay, I got four tile holes marked on this farm. They're all in a row. It's probably an old clay that's either one breaking down or two curving. When they lay that clay in a curving fashion, a lot of times they get some wide joints and over time, those wide joints form suck holes that look just like a tile hole. I'm gonna head home because I'm going to get pretty wet here shortly. Not really concerned, the GPS receiver is completely waterproof. It'd have to be to be mounted on the front of a tractor. This 4640 display though is not waterproof, so I'm gonna get home as fast as possible to keep it and myself dry. absolutely miserable drive home. That rain, ice cold. This back right tire is flat anytime we leave this gator sitting for longer than a week, or at least it's just noticeably flat and it's leaking the entire time. With that being known, and because the weather is terrible outside, I'm just gonna go ahead and jack this up, pop this tire off and run it into the tire shop to get looked at. Well everyone, I'm headed to the tire shop and based on the weather right now, probably not gonna do a whole lot for the rest of the day. I know this video has been all over the place. Farming can be like that sometimes where you got a million different projects you're working on all at once. Some of them go to plan, other ones don't turn out quite as well as you were hoping. That's definitely gonna be it for me though for this video. I greatly appreciate every single one of you continuing to tune in and support the channel. Your viewership means the world to me. I'll catch you guys all in the next episode. Until then, make sure you like the video if you enjoyed it, subscribe if you wanna see more, and comment down below if you have any questions. You know I love to talk about farming. Have a great day everyone, peace!